Well, thank you for that introduction. And hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, and the webinar today is Starbright Ultraviolet Dyes, Eight Ways to Improve Your Flow Cytometry Panels. And I think really I should just clarify before we start that the eight ways are the eight new ultraviolet dyes we have in our Starbright range. So we'll kick off with the agenda, what I'm going to talk about today. And firstly, why are there are more dyes required for flow cytometry? There's lots of dyes out there. Why do we need some new ones? And then I'll give an introduction to the eight new uh, Starbright ultraviolet dyes. And then talk about some of the benefits of Starbright dyes in your experiments and show some uh, comparison data. And then finally, we'll just uh, quickly show you some of the resources we have to help you with your flow cytometry experiments. I mentioned there is a greater need for more dyes, but why is this? And I think this is generally due to the greater need that is seen now for larger panel sizes. And I think I'm going to use immunophenotyping as an example to show here. So if you're looking at specific cells, uh, say T cells in a peripheral blood sample, you may only need four to six colors to identify the different T cells you want to see. And this would be uh, looking at markers such as CD3, CD4, 8, CD25, 127, something like that. And this allows you to see those T cells. However, being able to see the T cells is not necessarily I'm going to answer the question you have in your experiments. You may be looking at what's the memory status, how activated are these T cells, what's the cytokine profile, and therefore you need to add a lot more and more markers uh, to look at these different statuses and to be able to identify the different subsets within these, these uh, profiles such as memory. Uh, T cells, helper, uh, central memory, effector memory, for example. And then you've got to realize that T cells aren't the only cells in the immune system. So you want to maybe look at all the other cells in the immune system. So the B cells, the different myeloid cells that are present. Maybe there's malignant cells that are present. And you could even possibly look at minimal residual disease. So if you think that you have memory cells and, and look at the activation cells, uh, status of certain cells in those populations as well, you can see how four to six colors is not enough and you could easily be looking at 20, 30, possibly 40 different colors. And of course, being able to identify 40 different markers has become a real possibility now that people are using full spectrum flow cytometry. Now I've just mentioned flow, full spectrum flow cytometry there. And this is part of what I'm going to call cytometer innovation. So we have expanded numbers of lasers and numbers of filters. Uh, and then this allows you to build panels of increasing complexity. And when we're building panels, there are certain rules to follow. And I'm not going to go into these in detail because there's lots of other webinars where people talk about uh, the best practice in panel building. Um, but just to briefly run through the things that people uh, tend to do is, you, first off, understand that configuration of your instrument, know the fluorophore properties so that you know which fluorophores you can use on your instrument, rank the antigen density so that you compare those with the fluorophores correctly to get the optimal resolution in your experiment, know your marker expression patterns, titrate your antibodies and any other reagent, fluorescent reagents that you're using in your flow cytometry panel, and you may wish to include something such as a dump channel to try and clean up some of your uh, staining. And uh, if you are not uh, too familiar with panel building, we, d we actually do have a couple of services uh, available at Biorad. So we actually have a panel building service from our dedicated technical support team. And we actually have an online tool as well, which uh, enables you to build uh, multicolor panels in just a few simple steps by selecting your instrument, picking your markers, finding the fluorophores, and then finally choosing those antibodies that fit there. So you follow the best practice in panel building rules, but there can still be some challenges. As I mentioned, 
the cytometers now have an increased capability, which means you people are building these higher parameter panels and it leads to the requirement for more dyes. But are these dyes that you require necessarily available? And the challenges that you can find uh, within panel building still is that you may not have enough bright dyes, but you know, may not be able to detect the cells you're interested in. There can be some instability in the dyes and you can high have high levels of spillover leading to high levels of compensation and spreading, losing resolution. You may not wish to amend your workflow to incorporate special buffers. So you want to have dyes that can work regardless of the um, experimental workflow that you have already. When you have large panels, you're adding a, a, you know, 20, 30 more different antibodies at a time to uh, your, your mix and errors can be introduced. So, you know, you want to try and maybe find a way that you can reduce those errors. And then you can get inconsistent performance with beads or when you're doing your single cell compensation controls, if you're using beads, and you can get changes when you fix your dyes. So you want to be able to have a dye that is robust and flexible to be used uh, regardless of your experiment. So how can the H ultraviolet uh, star bright dyes help you? And I think before we go any further, I should just introduce star bright again. Um, so what are star bright dyes? Well, they are unique fluorescent dyes specifically developed for flow cytometry, and they do have superior brightness. We have improved the excitation and emission profiles, and they're able to produce a large stoke shift without being a traditional tandem. And they are compatible for both conventional and spectral flow cytometry. We have an extensive range. We have ultraviolet range, which I'm going to be talking about today. But we do have a uh, violet dye, star bright violet, excitable by the 405 uh, la nanometer laser. And we have nine of those. We do have star bright blue dyes, excitable by the 488 nanometer laser. And we have six of those. And we have just launched our first in the range of star bright yellow dyes, excitable by the 561 nanometer laser. And these are all conjugated to 34 uh, immunology antibodies for human and mouse. And we also have streptavidin labeled as well. But today, I'm going to talk to you mostly about our new range of star bright ultraviolet dyes. I did say that they were available on human and mouse targets. And so we have this is the list of the targets here. So we have 22 human targets available, 12 mouse targets and the streptavidin, as I mentioned. And these are available on all the star bright dyes that we have launched. So the star bright ultraviolet dyes, there's, as I mentioned, there's eight in the series of these ranging from star bright ultraviolet 400 all the way to star bright ultraviolet 795. And the first thing I should say is that they are bright. Uh, they've been designed to be as bright or brighter than the competitor dye. And we can just see here the a histogram of CD4 staining for star bright ultraviolet 400 against the competitor dye. And it is roughly twice as bright. And if we look at the table, we can see here we used CD4 again. And this is the average of three to four samples um, stained on human peripheral blood. And we determine the stain index for each sample. And as you can see, the star bright dyes in purple are brighter than the competitor dyes in red. Uh, and especially, this is especially true at the uh, longer stoke shift. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, being bright can be a double-edged sword. Bright means you can detect rare and low antigen density populations in, when it's detected in your channel of interest. But if it spills over into lots of other channels, you're going to get high levels of conversation and high levels of spreading and therefore reduction in resolution of your panel as a whole. So you want to have uh, good spectral characteristics as well. 
So I thought we'd just spend a little bit of time going over the characteristics of the Starbite Ultraviolet dyes. And the plots I'm going to show you are just a normalized uh, spillover of the dyes uh, taken from the data on the ZE5. So what we see is that the signal in the optimal channel has been set at 100%, and then all the signal in all the other channels is relative to that. And the first thing we can see is that star by ultraviolet 400 is spectrally very very similar to the competitor dye that is available however if you remember on the previous slide i showed you that it was actually brighter so we do have a benefit for star by ultraviolet 400. if we look at the next dye star by ultraviolet 445 this dye is spectrally unique it does have some spillover into other channels but this is not high level it is actually much brighter than the competitive dye that it, uh, at 20 times brighter uh, that we have seen. And there's actually no polymer dye equivalent to Starbot Ultraviolet 445, making it quite a unique dye. The next dye, Starbright Ultraviolet 510, again, this is spectral unique and brighter. However, you will notice that in red, you can see that in the first blue channel, which in this case is Fitzy, uh, is a, or Alexa 488, it would be a dye we'd use in that channel, there is more compensation to be done. And I'll show you this a little bit later in a bit more detail. But what it does mean, it is spectrally unique, and therefore is still a very uh, useful dye. And then start by ultraviolet 575. Now, in this instance, we actually have uh, a lot of spillover into the first yellow green channel which is PE but what we can say about star by ultraviolet 575 is again it's spectrally unique it is brighter than the nearest competitive dye and although there is spillover into that channel it's less than with the competitor continuing on to the other dyes in the series we have star by ultraviolet 605 again spectrally unique brighter and although again there is some compensation to be done uh, with PE Dazzle or uh, 594 or PE CF 594 it is less than the competitor dye. We have star by ultraviolet 665 um, and we can see again this is spectrally unique we have multiple peaks uh, like seen red across the spectrum um, and it's brighter than the competitor dye. Well, those extra peaks means there is slightly more compensation to be done um, in the violet, blue, and particularly with PE side 5. However, there is significantly less compensation to be done with dyes that are excited by the red 640 laser. So dyes such as Alexa 670 and Alexa 700. And this is all compared to the nearest competitor dye again. Uh, star bright ultraviolet 740 again spectrally unique it's brighter here you can see in red there is more signal uh, around the wet, what the uh, longer wavelengths of the yellow green laser so it would be more compensation to be done with something like PE psi 7 but again it has significantly reduced um, signal of the red laser and finally we have star bright ultraviolet 795, which again is spectrally, spectrally unique due to the fact that we have these little peaks uh, of the 488 and the 561 laser, but it is brighter than the competitor dye. So we do have some benefits, even if, where there is some increased um, spillover for all of the star bright ultraviolet dyes. There are benefits with being reduced spillover from other lasers, and they are all brighter. And this makes them all particularly useful in full spectrum flow cytometry because they do have spectrally unique profiles. So I've hopefully convinced you already that the star by ultraviolet dyes are going to be beneficial to your flow cytometry experiments. They're brighter, they have improved and unique spectral characteristics, 
But there are also other benefits to the Starbright ultraviolet dyes and the Starbright range as a whole. You get very, very reproducible staining with the Starbright dyes. Um, you can see here on the left hand side um, some staining, a CD4 staining on human peripheral blood using different buffers. And what we have found with Starbright dyes is that they work in virtually any buffer. So they work in PBS, they'll work in PBS. BSA or with FBS as a as a buffer, they will work in special buffers that are required to multiplex polymer dyes. Although they don't actually need a special buffer to multiplex themselves, and you can even use them with sodium azide or EDTA. Within lot, you get very very reproducible staining, and I can just show you this here in, in this middle graph. In green, we have a it is mouse CD3 stained with Starbright Blue 700. And in green is the original vial we opened back in September 2020 and we stained the sample and we got great staining. And then we took that original vial and in January earlier this year and compared the, the staining with that original sample to a fresh vial that we had never opened. So even though in red that antibody had been stored for 15 months in the fridge after opened, there was no difference from a fresh file. So within lot, you get very, very reproducible staining. And then we also want to make sure that you are getting the same high quality antibody regardless of the lot you're buying. And that you're getting similar performance from this high quality antibody. So you can see we have CD8, on, this is on Starbright Blue 700, and we compare in blue lot one to lot two uh, on the same sample. And you can see the traces overlap quite well, so you know you're going to get very, very reproducible staining regardless of the lot and, and within lot. Just to continue on this theme of reproducible staining, we did an experiment where we left some antibody in a master mix out for a period of time on the bench. And this was in ambient light at room temperature uh, for up to 14 days and then compared it to sample that had been kept in the fridge in the dark as recommended uh, on our data sheets. And we compared this to competitor dyes. Now, the first thing I should say is that all dyes that we tested, when they were stored at the correct temperature, in the correct conditions, all worked perfectly well and as expected. But we just wanted to see how stable were our dyes and how was that staining that you got, you know, if you treated them harshly. And so we can see, again, with the normalized uh, spectra to show the amount of signal in the optimum channel, um, in this case, this is Starbright Ultraviolet 605, and for some reason we did get a lot of signal in one of the yellow-green uh, filters. However, what I li would like to make the main point of this is that the spectra didn't change throughout the whole course of the experiment. So after 14 days, we could still get reproducible, same level staining as if the sample, being the, the antibody had been kept at four degrees. And the spectra didn't change over time. Now with the competitor dye, there was a, uh, some reduction of the um, signal over the two weeks, but you could still see the, the signal. However, you can see quite clearly that in blue is the spectra at four degrees, and in green and red, you can see how this has changed as the dye has been left out in the ambient uh, temperature and in the ambient light conditions. So it's not as stable as the Starbright dye. Now, so not, not all of the Starbright dyes will remain unchanged if you leave them out on the bench for two weeks. Uh, some are more stable than others. So I thought I'd show you an example of a Starbright dye that actually does lose some of its 
uh, fluorescence, its brightness over when it's left out over time. And so we can see here, actually, this is star bright violet 610. And you can see by four days, it's just re reducing its brightness a bit. And by two weeks, it's a significant reduction in the brightness. However, when we look at the spectral profile, you can see that this still has not changed. You are, even though you are losing some of the brightness, you are not getting a change in the spectral properties. So this is, means you're still going to get reproducible staining if, you're, if you have treated your antibodies harshly. And with the competitive dye, this is one that does re uh, reduce its staining as well to virtually zero in this case. Again, the competitor dye, you can see at four degrees, uh, you have the profile in blue. And when you leave it out for four days, that profile changes quite significantly. You're getting a lot of red uh, emission. And by 14 days, actually, there was just no signal. Um, so the Starbright dyes just do give you very, very reproducible data. Of course, we would not recommend leaving any antibody out on the bench for 14 days. Uh, always store them as is stated on the data sheet. Starbright dyes are fixable. So here we have two examples of the Starbright ultraviolet dyes that we have fixed. And they can, you can see that with a PFA uh, fixative it, up to 4%, you get a minimal loss of signal, if any. And in fact, you can see there on the right with Starbright Ultraviolet 510, you can fix in PFA and we've even fixed in methanol uh, with no reduction in signal. Now, this means that you are much, much more flexible when using Starbright dyes. You just come into the end of the day, you want to go home, you can fix your samples and analyze them when it's convenient for you. Uh, you can fix in uh, with the methanol fixation means you can do something like phospho flow uh, you can look at intracellular targets and not worry about the cell surface staining uh, changing and in addition to the brightness not uh, being lost when you fix star bright dyes the spectral profile doesn't change either or there, there's some maybe some minimal changes but nothing uh, too significant and we can see here we have two star bright ultraviolet examples on the left and two star bright violet examples on the right. And you can see that the fresh spectra in blue is very, very similar to the spectra um, when fixed at, with 2% PFA in green and 4% PFA in red. Again, giving you that confidence that you're going to get reproducible results regardless of your experimental protocol. Another issue that comes up when building multicolor panels is the compensation control. So the compensation control is a single stain sample uh, using the same fluorophores in your experiment at roughly the same expression level, and you need to collect enough uh, sample to do the compensation accurately. And this can be an issue. If you don't have um, very high expression of that marker. If that marker is regulated in your experiment, if you have rare cells, this can be a problem. Oh, and even if you have continuous expression of your markers, where do I set my gates? So often people would like to use beads, you know, antigen capture beads, for example, uh, compensation beads to uh, able to compensate these types of markers accurately. Now, Many people prefer to use cells uh, because you can see the autofluorescence levels. Um, but beads are sometimes essential, especially if you have a rare sample, a rare patient sample that you don't have access to, you don't want to waste doing all your compensation controls on. So we built a panel containing star bright ultraviolet, star bright violets, and star bright blue dyes. And we just put them on common markers uh, in human peripheral blood and we used cells as single stain controls and we were able to identify all the populations we needed. Uh, we didn't necessarily have anything that was too difficult in this panel and we compared the data we saw from the using cells to the data we obtained using compensation beads. 
and here's the data. So I'm not showing every single panel, because that's just too much to look at, but if you look at the very left hand side, here is the staining you see using cells as a compensation control for the CD19 B cells and CD3 T cells. And then CD14 and 16 to look at various myeloid populations. And CD4 and CD8 to look at the T helper and T cytotoxic T cells. And what you can see is that regardless of the type of beads used, so UltraComp, UltraComp Plus, ABC beads, comp beads, and even the new uh, spectra comp beads, you get very, very reproducible uh, staining and the spillover matrices were very similar, regardless of whether you use cells or beads. So star bright dyes are going to give you reproducible results, regardless of what that compensation control is going to be. And so just to prove, uh, in all the populations, so we calculate the percent positive for all the different populations we had, could identify, so the T cells, B cells, helper cytotoxic, different if memory uh, naive cells, the CD8, the CD4s, and those three different monocyte populations, the classical, intermediate, and non-classical, we actually saw reproducible similar percentage levels regardless of what that compensation control was. So the next question we had to ask ourselves was, well, what do the star bright ultraviolets look like together in a panel? So the steady 5 has seven channels available in the ultraviolet laser. We put seven ultraviolet dyes together and on common the common marks we have and looked at human peripheral blood. And as you'd expect, we were able to identify all the populations we expected to see, our B cells, T cells, different memory phenotypes on the uh, CD4s and CD8s, and then the naive and memory phenotype using RA and RO on the CD8 and CD4 cells. Very straightforward, really simple. There are three uh, things I'd like to point out. If we look at the spillover, you can see here, star by ultraviolet 510 does have some spillover into the FITI channel, as I pointed out earlier. Star by ultraviolet 575 does have some spillover into PE, and star by ultraviolet 665 does have some spillover into Alexa, 6, Alexa 700. However, these values are very manageable, not stopped us from identifying all the populations. And for star by ultraviolet 575 and star by ultraviolet 665 are lower than what is observed using competitor dyes. One quick thing I'd like to point out as an additional benefit of star bright dyes, um, before I move on to showing you some panels against competitor dyes, is that star bright dyes can be pre-mixed. So I mentioned earlier that if you have samples coming in over a period of time and you have a, uh, a large multicolor panel you wish to stain, it can take up a lot of your day making up that panel every single day. So if you had the ability to pre-mix a panel and then in large quantities and store this and then use that for several weeks, that would be a real advantage. And also you actually reduce the pipetting error that you can introduce and reduces the chance of forgetting to add an antibody which is a very real risk if you're adding 30 or 40 antibodies into a panel. So we compared a pre-mixed panel of star bright dyes containing violet and ultraviolet dyes. Uh, and we stored it for 33 days in the fridge and compared it to a panel we pre-mixed on, on the day. Um, and what we can see when we stained the same sample is that the staining was identical. Therefore, there are, there's no anomalies, there's no uh, strange interactions that, that the star bright dyes have when you store them for long periods as a premix in the fridge. So I've shown you all the benefits so far of star bright dyes and the star bright ultraviolet dyes in particular, and shown you that we have eight new dyes that are bright and have uh, improved or unique spectral 
profiles. So the time now is to show how do Starbright dice compare in a panel against competitor dice. And so here we had we did a 16 color panel where we had five Starbright ultraviolets, four Starbright violets, and we included two Starbright blue dyes, uh, plus a few other common dyes, and we stained human peripheral blood again for some of those common markers. And we compared it to a competitor dye panel um, that you can see here. And here's the data from that Starbright dye panel. I just think I should point out that the Starbright dye panel was stained in 1% BSA in PBS, so no special buffer was required. And what you can see quite clearly is in the myeloid population, you can identify those different um, classical, intermediate, and non-classical cells. You can identify the B cell populations via CD19 and then including CD20. You can see the T cells via CD3, and then you can look at um, various T cell populations, so the CD57 levels, CD62L levels on both CD4 and CD8s. And then within the CD4 and CD8 populations, you can look at naive and memory status with CD45 RA and RO, and then look at the levels of the uh, accessory molecules CD27 and CD28. And we can identify all these populations. And in the CD4 population, we can also identify Tregs via CD127 and CD25 surface staining. And it all looks very nice. And if you look at the competitor dye panel, it also looks very nice as well. You can see all the populations you'd expect to see, the myeloid populations, the different um, T cell populations, the B cell populations. You can see the naive and memory cells. You can identify the Tregs and the CD4 population and gain the different uh, levels of CD27 and CD28. So we take a closer look at the differences between the Starbright dye and the competitor panel. You know, so you can say, where are the benefits? And these benefits are in addition to the fact that you can premix the Starbrights. You don't require a special buffer. They are fixable with no loss of signal and they are spectrally stable, you can see that the extra brightness of the star brights gives you better separation for many of these cell populations. And we can see this here for CD14 on star bright ultraviolet 665, CD8 on star bright ultraviolet 605, CD19, star bright ultraviolet 575, and even here you can see the star bright violet 760 in this panel is showing better separation as well. There are instances where the difference is subtle or maybe there's no differences. And so you can say, well, you know, even with the, 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 the panel goes well together. And there are occasions where the panel doesn't work so well. So we can see here, in fact, that BB510 works better in this panel on CD28 than our Starbright Violet 515. But in general, the panel does seem to have better separation with the Starbrights. And so if we look at a panel where we've put 16 Starbright dyes together, again in 1% PBS BSA, no special buffer, we have uh, five Starbright ultraviolet dyes, six Starbright violet dyes, three Starbright blue, and two of our new Starbright yellow dyes. And this is a 23 color panel on a Z5, and I'm not going to go into every single population, but what we can say is that we can identify all the different cells we expect to identify. So the B cells, T cells, different memory phenotypes of T cells, uh, different monocyte populations, different granulocyte populations, and NK cell populations. So star bright dyes do work in very large panels and are compatible with other uh, fluorophores. Now, so far, all the data I've shown you is with conventional flow cytometry. But as we know, full spectrum flow cytometry is becoming ever more popular because of the ability to uh, put unique combinations and add more fluorophores into your panel and spectrally unmix fluorophores. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the differences between conventional and full spectrum flow cytometry. We do actually have a webinar available 
where we discuss full spectrum flow cytometry and star bright dyes in a little bit more detail. But suffice to say that the star bright dyes are compatible in full, full spectrum flow cytometry and the star bright ultraviolet dyes do work very, very well. So I just do have a little bit of data to go through to show you how well star bright dyes do work in uh, full spectrum flow cytometry. And we noticed early on that the dyes did have unique spectra. And so you can see here on the top left, star bright violet 610, and in then a competitor dye, brilliant violet 605. And when you combine the spectra, overlay them, you can see there are differences. And you can see at the bottom there, in conventional flow cytometry, you'd be detecting these in the same channel, and therefore they're not compatible to be used together. However, in full spectrum flow cytometry, you can actually unmix these two dyes because they are significantly different from each other. So you can see here, CD3 on star by blue 700, and we put CD4 on brilliant violet 605, CD8, we had star by violet 610, and you can see the two T cell populations. And this led us to look at what other, other combinations can you do. And we noticed that star bright violet 440 is actually detected in a different channel to BV421 and Pacific Blue. And this is on a Cytec Aurora. And so you can actually use them together. You can uh, unmix all three of these dyes um, very successfully. And we found more novel combinations. So I've shown you examples here of star bright ultraviolet 510. It can be on mix from BUV 496. Star bright ultraviolet 665 can be on mix from BUV 661. Um, from the violet range, BV 510 can be on mixed from star bright violet 515. Star bright violet 710 can be on mixed from brilliant violet 711. And even our star bright blue 700 can be on mixed from Percy Sci 5.5. And if you look at the spectra, you'll find that seven out of the eight star bright ultraviolets are spectrally unique from the competitor dyes. Uh, from the, and nine out of nine of the star bright violet are spectrally unique from the competitor dyes with similar uh, e e emission max. And we're still to, fight to fully validate star bright blue and star bright yellow dyes that we have but we expect those to have unique spectra as well. So this means that you have more choice and the possibility to adding more dyes to your large spectral panels with star bright dyes. And star bright ultraviolet in particular really does give you a lot more uh, flexibility of that 355 nanometer laser. And here is the obligatory large panel in full spectrum flow cytometry. So this is a 31 color panel on a four laser instrument. And this contains five star bright ultraviolet dyes, eight violet dyes and five star bright blue dyes. Uh, and this is combined with multiple brilliant violet and ultraviolet dyes. So this panel was done in brilliant stain buffer and the star bright dyes are compatible in all buffers, so it works really well, gives you much more flexibility in your experiments. And as you'd expect from a panel that contains more markers, you can identify more cells than the 23 color panel we had showed earlier. We can still identify the lymphocytes, but we can identify more NK cells, NKT. We can identify gamma delta T cells, and as well as all the granocytes, monocytes, and different T cell and B cell populations. So if we just recap the properties of the star bright dyes, they'll brighter than the competitor dyes. And this allows you not only to see rare and large and density populations, but allows you to um, effectively separate out lineage positive cells. So you can look at that, those lineage negative populations. You, they have narrow excitation and emission profiles that are, um, that makes them actually compatible, not just on conventional flow cytometers, but in spectral flow cytometers as well, because those excitation and emission profiles are unique. They work in all buffers, so there's no drop in performance with any common staining buffer, and you don't need a special buffer when you are multiplexing using star bright dyes. 
They give you very, very consistent staining. They're stable with minimal lot-to-lot -lot variability. You can fix them in PFA and alcohol fixation. And their stability, both uh, when tested uh, in fixation and under strained conditions, with uh, they're not light sensitive, their spectra doesn't change with those conditions either. And they are suitable for pre-mixing. Again, just adding to that flexibility you have with Starbite dyes. They're multiplexing compatible. It increases your flexibility in what you can get from Biorad. It increases the range, the size of, of spectral panels because of their uh, unique spectra. And at the moment, they're on common immunophenotyping targets. They're known clones, highly cited. Uh, I showed you what they were earlier, and we are all adding to these all the time. So if we go back to the panel building challenges, and we ask the question, how can the eight star bright ultraviolet dyes help you in your flow cytometry experiments? And if we go back to those challenges, you know, some cells are hard to detect because not all dyes are bright. We need more bright dyes. Well, star bright dyes are bright. If you can have issues due to instability and uh, with your dyes and have high levels of compensation spreading, so you need stable dyes with unique narrow excitation emission profiles making them suitable for multiplexing and star bright dyes can give you that you may not wish to uh, amend a, a workflow that you know is working to incorporate something like a special buffer well star bright dyes don't need a special buffer so you can add them into existing panels or start new panels uh, using star bright dyes if you are making large panels and pipetting large numbers of, of antibodies, you can introduce errors. And so it's nice to be able to have the benefit of being able to pre-mix a panel and keeping it in its fridge for a period of time. And Starbright dyes allow you to do that without any change to the staining of the uh, samples. And you want to have consistent performance when fixed or to have consistent performance with cells or beads to allow you to be flexible in which compensation controls you wish to do. And Starbright dyes give you very, very reproducible data regardless of what you use for a compensation control. In addition to having excellent dyes that will help you with your flow cytometry, we do have a lot of support and resources that will help you as well. And it'll help you use the, your, the, the reagents that are at your disposal to make sure that you make the most of them and you get the most out of your experiment. So we have lots of dedicated web pages showing data on Starbright dyes. We have the spectra, we have panel data, and this is both in convention and full spectrum flow. We have online tools such as the Spectra Viewer, a panel building tool. Tech support will do uh, panel building for you. And we're always updating our software on the ZE5. And in addition, we do have general flow cytometry specific literature. So things like bro uh, floor four posters, uh, data posters, flow guides, workbook, you know, things to help you with things like controls, for example. So you can find them all on our website. And here at Barad, it's not just Starbright dyes that we have. We do have a very large range of antibodies, uh, both primaries and secondaries, monoclonals and polyclonals, and we even have our recombinant HUCAL range as well. And we have uh, a di a specially validated antibodies, uh, so our precision ab, ab antibodies for Western blotting and uh, phospho-specific precision ab antibodies. And we have a range of antibodies suitable for immunology, cancer, neuroscience, veterinary immunology, regulated cell death, and infectious disease. Um, and these are available as single vials or available in bulk quantities as well. And we have a state-of-the-art AI-powered search engine, which allow you to find not just your antibodies you may be interested in, but um, literature and resources in there as well. And with that, I think I will stop and just let you know that you can sign up to receive our emails where you can find out more about Starbright dyes at biradantibodies.com forward slash star or visit the webpage at biradantibodies.com forward slash starbright to get more information on Starbright dyes. 
And I think now would be a perfect time to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mike, for such an informative webinar. We have now moved to the Q&A part of our webinar. Please send us any questions by using the Q&A widget. We'll follow up with any outstanding questions by email. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, our first question is, we currently use a master mix with our current blue and red laser dyes. What are the storage requirements when mixed with other dyes from FITC to APC? Okay, thank you for that. Um, I can only go on what we have done uh, with the Starbright dyes. And when we did our pre-mixing uh, panels with the Starbrights, we um, stored them in the fridge at four degrees. So as long as they're kept in the dark, um, they seem to be very, very stable. And we didn't see any unwanted interactions either with Starbright dyes or with any other dyes that we had in our panel. And there didn't seem to be any loss of signal or, or anything. So I think as long as you store them as the manufacturer recommends, um, they should be all fine. Great, thanks Mike. The next question is, I work in a clinical setting and we're moving to 10 or 12 color. What are these re reagents regulatory status? Are they research use only or ASR? Yeah, it's a good question. So we only make uh, research use only antibodies here at Biorad. Um, and that doesn't mean you can't validate themselves, uh, the antibodies themselves uh, by yourself in your own lab. Uh, but it's not something that we are uh, going to do at Biorad. Great, thanks. Uh, someone wants to know what size the Starbright dyes are. Are they similar to key dots? Yes, I get asked this quite a lot. So the size is around 18 to 22 nanometers. Um, and the short answer is no, they are not the same as Q dots. Uh, Q dots have uh, a cadmium core, for example, so they contain heavy metals, and Starbright dyes do not. And um, I seem to remember that the Q dots, uh, their size determined what their uh, emission maxima was. And so the stability wasn't quite always uh, optimal. Um, whereas the Starbright dyes, the, the emission is not linked to the size of the, of the particle. Um, so as I showed today, they're very, very stable and you get very reproducible data. So they, they are not uh, similar to Q dots at all, actually. Great, thanks, Mike. Some cytometers have a 375 nanometer laser rather than the 355 nanometer option. Are Starbright ultraviolet dyes excited by the 375 nanometer laser? Oh, interesting, interesting question. Um, the short answer to that is I don't actually know. Uh, we actually designed our dyes to be specific to be excited by the five main laser lines and the five laser lines that are present on the ZE5. Um, so we actually designed the ultraviolet dyes to be excited by the 355 laser. Uh, and now I know there are some instruments with a 375 laser. Um, so actually that's something we should investigate. So yeah, okay, we will, we will have a look at that and make that data available for those that are interested. Great. Um, you mentioned some situations where there's more compensation with Starbright than competitor dyes. For example, a Starbright Ultraviolet 510 into the FITSI channel. Does that mean I should avoid using the Starbrights with FITSI in the same panel? Okay, um, short answer again would be no. So when you're building panels, you have to consider lots of things. And I did show a, a best practice in panel building slide at the very start. Um, and really it depends what other fluorophores you have in your panel. And it depends what markers you're looking at. Um, now, although there is some more spillover with Starbright Ultraviolet 510 in that example you gave me there, uh, it's not really very high. And if you were using FITSI and PE off the 488 laser, 
for example, you would have to do quite significant compensation between FTSE and PE. So, you know, and people do it. So it's not a problem. And there's always compensation to be due because every single floor floor you add into your panel will have an effect on all the other floor floors in that panel. Uh, so I think, you know, with, with good compensation, uh, you will um, you can see what the level of uh, was with you'll see the level of spillover and you'll be able to compensate for it. Um, but there are also things like using mutually exclusive markers for uh, dyes that do have spillover where you don't want to, uh, where you may have an issue. So, for example, you could put it on CD3 for T cells and CD19 for B cells. And then the, the spillover is not an issue because you don't have uh, cells that are positive for both. And if you did, you would know your compensation had gone wrong. So I think it really de uh, depends on a few things. Um, but even though, you know, in this instance, this example, there was a little bit more spillover, um, it's not a problem. And with careful panel design, these things can be overcome. Right. In some of my panels, I also want to detect intracellular markers. Can I still use Starbright dyes for surface markers, or will they be affected by the fixed perm buffers? Uh, again, that's a good question. Uh, so we have tested uh, the Starbright dyes with many of the common fixed perm reagents that are available to purchase. And we found that there is minimal effect on the Starbright dyes. Uh, when you do a surface stain followed by the fix and then perm and then look at intracellular staining. Um, you know, the Starbright dyes are very, very stable and they don't seem to be affected by either the fixative or the perm reagent. So, uh, yes, we would say you can do that and you will get very, very reproducible results. Great. Thank you, Mike. There's some markers that I use that aren't available conjugated to Starbright dyes. Will you be introducing any more? And if not, can you do custom conjugation or can I buy a kit to conjugate myself? Yeah, I get, we, we do get asked this quite a lot. Uh, as you can imagine, um, it quite, uh, quite takes a long time to conjugate all these dyes to all these antibodies. And we have got 23 dyes out there now. So we have, you know, in the last two years, we've been very busy. Um, and we will be bringing out more, but we just uh, we're concentrating on launching new dyes at the moment. So next year we will have some more markers available, uh, and uh, next year we will start to provide a custom conjugation service, and we will bring out a conjugation kit as well. So you can conjugate all your favourite antibodies that you use that maybe don't have as many marker uh, so many formats on them. Uh, commercially available, and we will bring out the conjugation kit for all the Starbright dyes. So that will hopefully give you a lot more options um, than just what you can buy off the shelf from us. Thank you. And our final question is, are Starbright dyes suitable for use in microscopy? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have done some testing in microscopy. As you can imagine, a bright, stable dye that has unique uh, emissions would be quite useful for, for microscopy. Uh, and we have been doing some testing and we've got some good results, but we are not quite ready to share those results yet because they, it's preliminary data. Uh, and we want, we want to make sure that we can give uh, our customers the right protocols the right information on how to use them optimally, you know, to make sure that, that, that people get the best results they can. And as these dyes were initially designed for flow cytometry, we just we, we want to make sure that we are getting the, the, the right testing that, that done for microscopy. But we have done some wide field microscopy and some confocal microscopy. And so far, they work very well. And I think maybe next year we'll be ready to share some of those results. Thank you very much, Mike, for all those answers to the question and such an informative webinar. And thank you to everybody for listening. That's all we have time for today. Um, if you have submitted a question and we haven't answered it, we'll follow up now by email. 
And if you're interested in viewing the webinar again, it will shortly be available on demand. So thank you, everyone.